Okay, the meeting is being recorded. Looks like the participants have all chimed in. So we'll close that poll. Tuck it away, you're 100% repeat customers. That's great. So this polling process is something you're familiar with. You'd select one of the options. Okay. Great. And with that, I will turn the meeting back over or turn it over to Rebecca Hargrave. Rebecca is a colleague and friend from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Shenango County and she will be speaking tonight about diseases of forest trees. Welcome Rebecca. The floor and microphone and uh, airwaves are yours. All right. Good evening everyone. Um, Nice to have you all here. <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about diseases of forest trees, and um, um, as Peter said, this will be you know recorded if you want. But it, at any time during the presentation, if you have questions, just type it into the chat pod, and I'll try to. And hopefully, if I'm if I miss it, Peter will catch me, and uh, we can answer your questions as we go along. Um, whenever I talk about forest diseases, the first thing that I really what I, you know, you really want to preface it all with forest health. Individual diseases on individual trees don't really mean that much, but when you have a lot of disease on a lot of different trees, um, or um, you know, one serious disease on a lot of trees, that can really have effect on the overall forest uh, productivity. And so we're, we're really concerned with overall forest health. Um, that if it's not very high, forest, low forest health can mean smaller, less productive, and even shorter lived trees, which can affect all of our goals in, uh, in forestry. The things that we're going to be looking at besides just diseases, um, there's so many pieces of the puzzle. What is the soil quality? Um, how suitable is it for the trees that are growing there? What's our air quality? How much spacing do we have in our trees? Um, between our trees, how much you know, rooting area do they have? How much light? Um, it's available, how much water, and what's the quality of that water. And then we also, then we start to think about the stressors, the, the pests, what can get in there, uh, insects, diseases, um, how severe are they, how many are there. Some of those, those stressors, the causes of poor health, um, we also call them predisposing factors. Some of them are initial attack kinds of things, but most of them are secondary. They come behind some um, other issue. And d they would include diseases, insects, wildlife damage, um, which is both a primary and a secondary, and we include ourselves in that. And then also abiotic things, and that's primarily things like pollution or weather events um, that, are, um, that, have a, that are an event that happen. Some of the effects of poor health. On an individual tree level, we have uh, a, reduce, a reduction in the canopy. It thins out, and we see a reduction in chlorophyll, which of course leads to an overall decline in, in individual tree health, root dieback, decreased water, water and nutrient up, uptake, um, reduced growth rates, loss of limbs, and eventually tree mortality if it's serious enough. And overall, we'll see not only reduction in timber volume, but reductions in wildlife food and cover, reductions in water and air filtration, and an overall reduction in aesthetics. If you've ever been in a forest that looks, um, that, or that has really bad, really low forest health, you can just tell the trees are all relatively sickly. They might have lots of cankers or just growing very gnarly, and you can, you can generally, it kind of feels different in, a, in an area with the bad forest health. There are two problems that we come into, um, we're looking at individual tree uh, diseases or, or fungus especially, there are structural and non-structural issues and non-structural problems can lead to decay or um, tree death but most of the time we're looking at uh, things that lead to decay and um, non, or that's a structural problem, sorry, non-structural problems um, are things that affect the health of the tree. Um, we're looking at leaf and twig dieback, 
vascular wilts, nutrient imbalances, other fungus that attack the twigs and the, the outer the cambium of the tree, uh, leads to stunting and poor growth and t it can tissue death and potentially tree mortality. Um, and then we have our structural problems which affect decay or, or lead to decay and they affect the soundness of the tree. They can be caused by you know, weather events or humans, human damage, insects, disease, wildlife, all sorts of things. And they often work in tandem with each other. Just a few notes about decay before we start. Um, decay is basically the breakdown of wood. And it's generally started by a wound in the bark, uh, damage, tapping from maple production, logging, insect damage. And decay is a, an issue because it can, can lead to declining growth rates within the tree and kind of loss um, of, of wood within that tree. And it can also be a big safety issue. Um, if you have a lot of damaged trees and they have um, uh, decay in them and you're out in the woods, it can be a potential factor of having a tree fall on you or large limbs in or weather events or sometimes they'll just, they can just break apart on their own. And so really kind of mi trying to mitigate um, how much decay and standing trees you have is is important while balancing it with um, the potential forest management goals you have of, of wildlife or, or other other instances where having large trees with decay in them is, is part of the goal. Once you have a wound um, in a tree, what we often see is it's not just a hollow area right behind that wound. That decay can extend through the tree, um, forming a column of decay, usually extending well above and below the, the source of decay. And if Sometimes you'll have two holes within a tree that are connected through decay. Um, I, when we're in the forest, we want to minimize this, um, minimize the damage that can potentially lead to decay, and then that decay can um, to keep the decay that decay from becoming a, a problem for us. Um, we'll be covering primarily two of our major disease categories, which are fungus and bacteria, but we also talk about um, viruses and nematodes are grouped into the different disease, into the category of disease. And these are all things that will um, attack or follow in after another attack and cause either structural or tree health problems to our trees. For, um, for a disease to happen, we need three things, and if you you may have seen this before, um, this is our disease triangle, and we need to have, of course, the host tree, um, the the plant that we are concerned about, and it needs to have that pathogen present, the, the pathogen pathogen that could potentially infect the tree, and even if those two things are both present, needs to have the correct environment to facilitate that pathogen getting into the tree whether it's the right, right climate conditions, whether it's a wound in the tree. Um, there's lots of different elements that, that have to fit into place for that, that disease to actually make it into the tree and to begin to cause problems. I'm going to go through um, a few different types of diseases and kind of what they do. And, and hopefully these are ones that you have, have seen um, or you might be able to find in your forest. And, um, hopefully give you some of the, the basics on what you can, if anything, do about them. Um, this first one is called anthracnose, and this is a very common foliar disease. This primarily affects the leaves, but can also um, d cause twig, twig dieback, um, and in, some, in severe cases can cause branch and even stem dieback and um, things like dogwood. But uh, we primarily see, um, at least here in New York where I am, uh, we see this a lot on sycamore, which is the, the, the picture on the slide. And uh, this is a, a disease that is spurred on by wet spring weather, and it forms necrotic leaf lesions along the veins of the leaf and then throughout the leaves and into twigs and buds in some cases. And the, the primary problem with a disease like anthracnose is that it can cause a reduction in, in photosynthetic area and re that reduces the amount of, of energy that the tree can produce, how much um, carbohydrates it can produce. If it's severe enough, it can cause, potentially cause defoliation, which of course, if you have multiple defoliations, that can really 
take a toll on the tree as it tries to push out new leaves to continue growing. And so multiple def defoliations, we generally say you know, three to five severe defoliations um, can, can kill a tree. But for anthracnose, this is something that in most cases it's not necessarily worth treating, and so we don't usually manage for this in a in the forest setting. Um, the sycamores, you get it, they tend to recover from it well. Um, other trees, the um, um, mag or the um, dogwood anthracnose, in the landscape you would you might spray for that because uh, that can that can do a tree in um, relatively quickly. Um, this next slide is anthracnose on oak and the sim similar kinds of symptoms, but you'll see that it pretty much happens on every, or not every, but a lot of different hardwood species. Uh, most of them are in the springtime. Walnut anthracnose happens in the fall, and so you'll see the, the dark lesions on the walnut leaves um, generally right before they drop, and so um, you might still be seeing some of that, but most of that's on the ground right now. Um, and so anthracnose is, is kind of one of those you know it's there. If you have really high levels of it, you might consider changing over the species that are in your, your forest um, if they're starting to die off because of it, um, or mo removing the trees that are very susceptible. Anthracnose is also specific to um, trees. Sycamore anthracnose is a different disease than what's going to be on the, the walnut or the oak, and so um, that's just something else to consider. Another foliar, um, foliar disease, this is called oak leaf blister, and it generally starts off as uh, yellow circular areas on the leaves, and then as it grows throughout the summer, kind of forms into these raised blisters. It does require that cool, moist weather in the springtime. Most of our diseases are going to require um, moist, temp moist air and um, moderate temperatures usually that will um, that that moist air is really what's going to help those spores th spread through the air some of them some of our diseases um, the spores are actually airborne they can be blown around some splash in water and some can be carried around in uh, you know on, on animals or on insects from one tree to another um, oak leaf blister if you if you've not seen it is a really neat disease it really doesn't cause any problem um, to the trees. The amount of leaf area that it takes up is usually in insignificant and it comes on with full force at the end of the summer and so you don't, you know, by that time the leaves are shutting down and so it doesn't really, um, it's not something we'd really manage for, but it's a really good example of, of a leaf disease, an inconsequential leaf disease. It overwinters on the twigs themselves and uh, will reinfect in the spring. And so often if a tree has this, it'll continue to have this year after year, if weather conditions are appropriate. Another group of fungus is the uh, cankers, and they're funguses that generally infect trees through wounds, and they kill living tissue in the area right around the infection. Um, the big thing is that they're, they have kind of two issues. One is that they are killing living tissue, and if depending on where they are on the branch or on the stem, they can kill all the tissue above that, and so you might um, either lose some, some potential limbs, or you could, if it's on the main stem, it could actually kill the whole tree. Um, but it can also be an entry point for a, a rot or a decay fungus. And um, from that perspective, it's going to be potentially something you want to manage for. Um, most of our cankers have no controls, and when I primarily when I say controls, I'm referring to, to sprays or management techniques um, that we might use other than you know, removing trees. And so if, if it doesn't really have a control and you want to manage for it, you're going to be removing the tree to, to cut down on the amount of the inoculum that's around, the amount of spores, the potential infectious material that's, that's around in your forest. Um, this is one of my favorite cankers. This is called black knot. Um, it affects cherries and plums, and um, it's easily identifiable. Um, it really looks like poop on a stick. It's exactly <laughs> what it looks like in the picture. And it, um, um, there's another picture. This infects in the spring, and it's a perennial canker, and so every year it'll, it'll grow, advancing at the margins. And it can be a rather small um, canker, as it is on the twig, 
or can be quite large and eventually over you know a span around a moderate sized stem. Um, they can be up to a foot in length or, or larger, and it can cause serious problems um, not only to you know the, the, the small plums and uh, small cherries, but if you have if you're managing for black cherry, um, this is something that you definitely want to be aware of. Um, overall, it's a it's a minor problem in the, the, the grand scheme of forest diseases, but if you are looking to manage for high quality cherry and you have some of them that are more susceptible to black knot, you start to see that some of your trees are starting to get it, you're definitely going to want to go in and, and try to remove as much of this canker as you can. And that can be easily done by pruning. You can just cut the cankers out and leave them on the ground. They won't reinfect. Um, but some, you know, genetically some trees are more susceptible to this. And so you do have to keep a, an eye out for that um, if you're you know, looking to manage for cherry. Um, you might need to reconsider what your your species are on that in that area if you have an exceptional amount of black knot and your trees just keep tend to keep getting it. Once a tree, you know, once a tree, if a tree is susceptible and it gets it once, if you, even if you cut it out, it will probably come back. It's a very, very common uh, disease. And this is an example of what that can look like on a larger, you know, or multiple of them in in one. There's two trees here growing next to each other that have it. Um, one of the other things it can do is it can, as it starts to, as it gets older, it starts to break down and um, it can be a good host for invading or uh, boring insects and so it kind of can compound itself because of that. Next year are target cankers. This is a group of cankers that will go after a lot of different, um, we primarily see them in hardwoods, but a lot of different trees. And uh, this is a perennial canker, and you can see each year it kind of kills a, a, a ring of wood, giving it this kind of cobra head look. Um, the nectary canker kills the bark, but not the wood, and um, it could continue to grow around, and the trees will often still continue to grow. Um, if eventually it gets big enough, it can girdle or cut off the the flow of nutrients in, within that tree, but we'll often have trees that live a long time with these cankers in them. Um, we see much more of this in bad sites, um, at, at high elevations, it's kind of sh uh, shallow or in fertile soils, or in cold pockets on, on low areas or in poorly drained soils. And so we don't see this as a, um, a primary invader, so to speak. We, we see this as a uh, secondary result of poor sites, and so um, if you have a lot of this, you might be considering you might consider removing the, the trees that do have it, but you might also look at the site and determine whether or not you have too many trees on that site and you need, they need to be thinned. Um, if if other species should be planted in there that are going to withstand the the particular um, elements that that site is, is, is particular things that that site requires. Those trees require to live on that site. Oh, it's one of those days. Um, and so you you might need to be putting better, more better matched species in that site versus ones that are that are even natively growing there. Beach bark disease. Um, this is a, a kind of a complex, so to speak, of of disease and insect. Um, Beach bark disease, the um, diseases themselves are nectario, neo nectario um, fungus cankers. And so they they are similar to that one that we were previously just looking at. Um, but what happens is first aphids move in, the beach bark, um, or scales, excuse me, not aphids, beach bark scales move in. And that's the, the picture on the upper left hand, um, kind of middle side of the, the, pic, the frame. And those scales, Scale insects feed on the sap of trees, and so they kind of inject their beaks down into the tree and start sucking, and the quantity of scales weakens the defenses of the tree and allows for the, um, the beech bark disease funguses to, to kind of get in there and, and set up shop. And this is very common um, in most of, of, of New York and a lot of the Northeast, and so we're seeing a lot of our, our nice beach being destroyed by beech bark disease. And um, 
beech bark disease doesn't usually kill the tree. It most definitely makes it look like it's gone through one hell of a beating. Um, but what happens is that once that nectar canker gets in there, um, it continues to weaken the tree's defenses, allowing other things like hypoxylin canker and armillaria to get in and other boring insects. And a lot of times um, it actually weakens it to the point where the trees are snapped by weather events. And um, beach snap is, is kind of what that's referred to. Um, and they'll snap right at where the, the cankers are. Um, both of the, the fungus species that infect beach, um, with beach bark disease are native, but the, the scale insect is um, an exotic. And that's one of the reasons they, they feel that this is really you know, recently, well, in the last you know, eight decades, become a big problem. The, um, um, the scale has just really been able to hammer away allowing the beach bark diseases to get in. This next group is our uh, vascular wilts. And um, vascular wilts are funguses that get into the vascular system of the tree and, and plug it up. They, they're kind of like a plaque in, the, in your arteries, and it just kind of stops it up. And so this is a, this is a picture of Dutch elm disease. And the bark, the, this is just where the bark has been peeled off the twig. Um, the, the, the coloration that you see is the actual fungus within the vascular system. And Dutch elm disease is a, it's, it's also, you know, vectored by an insect. And that's one of the reasons why it was spread so quickly. Um, but it can kill a tree within a few seasons. And this vascular blockage will cause a, a yellow flag in the crown where we see the, um, uh, where the, the the wilt is, and then we can peel back the bark and, and see this purpley brown striping, and uh, it it's generally the first sign of the tree going down. Um, most of the time, Dutch elm disease isn't a big deal anymore because most of our elms, at least in the northeast, are pretty much wiped out. Um, there are some pockets where we still have really nice elms, and a lot of times they're they're managed um, with a lot of chemicals to keep the the beetles at bay. Um, and, but luckily for us, we have a new one in New York. <laughs> this um, is one that's been in the Midwest for a, a long time. It's unsure whether or not it's a native or an exotic, but this is oak wilt, and um, it works in the same fashion. Um, this is also carried from tree to tree by beetles that are attracted to open wounds on the trees, and they transfer the fungus, they feed on the tree and transfer the fungus, and that causes the vascular wilting to start. The, um, the lower left-hand corner is the leaves. That would have, they're showing typical symptoms for oak wilt. They keep kind of a green bottom, and they, they lose all their color in the top. And generally, if we see that, that's kind of our first warning that there might be oak wilt in the tree. Um, the other thing that happens with oak wilt that's different from Dutch elm disease is that they form these pressure mats of, of fungus on the bark and on the wood, and they um, start to build up and kind of push against each other. And so you can see the picture on the left it would have a corresponding um, mat on the, the bark and begin to actually break apart in that area. So you'll see a crack around that fungus um, in the bark. And so you can see that mat kind of push out. And so that's another way to identify it. This is relatively new to, to New York. It was spotted um, over the summertime in the Albany area. And um, so we're kind of gearing up, hopefully, hoping that it's not really that widespread. It primarily attacks red oaks, but um, it can get into white oaks if the levels are high enough. The, um, they've been managing this very well in the Midwest. And so this isn't something that we expect to come in and really take out all of our oak trees. But it, it's another management consideration. Um, this is something that's the beetles are attracted to damaged trees, and so um, being staying out of the woods in, in, in May and June, um, when you might have damage to oak trees, um, you know, avoiding avoiding um, logging damage, um, you know, even avoiding cutting where they might be attracted to the stumps, and then be in the area for smaller wounds. And so, um, it's definitely a management consideration. Um, are there any questions at this time or 
You know, if they go one. And there'll be a lot of, um, there's a lot of good fact sheets and as Pete put up for us and we'll show at the end, the U.S. Forest Service fact sheets have all sorts of um, things about oak wilt and all these things that we're talking about. So if you want more information. So this next group um, are Russ. Oh, um, are there natural immunities to these fungus? Yes, um, we do see as you know, with any po as in with any population, there are certain trees that are immune to um, a lot of the different funguses. And so, um, for with beech, for example, you can have stands that are just riddled with beech bark disease and come across some beautiful looking beech that are able to either withstand the the scale or the disease. And so, there are, in theory, su you know, superior strains of a lot of our trees. And with the elms. Um, there are like the Liberty Elm series, which are trees that have shown a high level of resistance to Dutch elm disease. And so a lot of times we do plant or recommend planting those, those strains of trees that are showing you know, good resistance. And, and even when we say that they're resistant, um, they, they might eventually come down with the disease, but the, either the, the odds are that you know, 99 out of 100 of them won't, or they'll just be able to withstand the presence of that disease for a much longer time before they succumb to it. And so, um, yep, definitely some of our trees are immune to these, these fungus, and really glad about that. <laughs> um, so this next group is called their rust diseases, and rust can, they're kind of a neat fungus. They tend to, they live on two separate hosts, and they have up to five different life stages. Um, fungus are a little bit different than the um, um, you know, than regular animals or you know plants that we know of, and how that they actually transform from one life stage to another. And so, the um, um, the rust can will have two or three stages on one host, and two or three stages on another host, and they kind of jump from one tree to another. This is cedar apple rust, and if you still have crab apples out with leaves on, you might be able to go find this. This is a very, very common uh, problem. And um, this is, of course, the, the fungus on the, the leaves of the apple. And then this is what the fungus on the cedar looked like. It's pretty cool. Um, on the left are the pictures of kind of the, the dried um, uh, galls. And you can go out and find these now. They'll, they persist on the tree. And in the spring, um, they push out these really cool gelatinous horns, telio horns, that are this you know, bright orange color, just like you see there. And so they're really easy to spot. Um, this is relatively inconsequential to the cedar. They, you know, the cedar could really care less that it's there. Um, it just looks you know, kind of crazy. On the apple trees, um, it comes on in the fall, the, the cedar's relief of spores in the late spring, and so it moves over to the apple tree then, and the um, by the end of the summer, the apple trees are looking pretty rough, and it generally isn't severe enough to cause too much, too many problems, but it can, if it builds up a lot on the leaf, can cause some um, photosynthesis um, you know, problems. The, um, the bigger issue is that a lot of times these are people's you know, yard trees or street trees, and they just look horrible. Um, so, so most of the time we're controlling for it that way, and this is a this is a good example of there are varieties of apple and crab apple trees that are just naturally resistant to cedar apple rust, um, or they've been bred to be resistant, and so we we recommend planting those um, over over the other ones. And you can spray for this um, with a, a you know the, a, a fungicide or a horticultural oil, but I wouldn't necessarily think it'd be warranted. Um, there are many different types of, of um, cedar apple rust type things. Um, other plants in the, the same family as apple or the rose family, there's cedar quince, cedar hawthorn, um, and so they all, they can all have, they all have similar little characteristics like this. Another one is the, the pine pine or the western gall rust. And in the east we see this primarily on um, scotch pine, and it lives 
it, it's pine pine. It lives on one pine tree, then moves to another pine tree, and then back. And um, this is um, can also be found on jack pine, um, but Australian Amugo pine sometimes can get it, but usually I see it on Scotch pine, and it forms these these knobby galls that can be you know, bright orange or yellow um, when they're sporulating, oops, when they're releasing their spores. And if they, um, the tree is heavily infested, you'll be able to look up in the tree and you'll see what looks like marshmallows kind of stacked throughout the branches. Um, and uh, they can be attacked multiple times. It doesn't necessarily affect, in the northeast, doesn't necessarily affect the, the overall health of the tree. If you're looking at Scotch pine, you know, that's not really a, a high value tree most of the time. Um, they, in, in the west, it can get, you know, in, in, and in Scotch pine, it can get into the main stem of the tree. And so that's really more of what you want to avoid. Um, they, uh, the galls can start to grow for two, or th two to four years before they actually sporulate, and so you have plenty of time to get in there and prune them out if you start to see them form. Um, they do cause the growth to slow and witch's brooms to form, and the tree gets even more gnarly than scotch pine already is, um, and it you know, just makes the tree more susceptible to other problems. You're going to move to the the rot type funguses, and um, there is a th this next group are, are all funguses that generally enter through some kind of wound, and they form they create rot or decay on their own. Um, and this is a these are the kinds of things that you want to av avoid if your tree has been damaged by weather or by mechanical injury. You want to kind of or you hope that um, these things don't move in. There's not a whole lot you can do to prevent it, but um, these are just a, a few of them that you might run into. Um, this is the artist conch, which I'm sure is something that uh, you have in your forest if you haven't seen it already. Um, it has that kind of brown surface on top, and then the bottom is a creamy white, and you can break it off of the, the trunk, and it um, is, can be etched into with a, a stylus or you know, painted on, and so that's why, how it gets its name, artist conch. Um, it's a perennial canker, and so it, it'll continue to grow every year with the with the tree. Um, and by the time you have that fruiting body, that that mushroom or that conch um, growing on the side of a tree, there's already extensive decay within the trunk of the tree. And the conch or the mushroom is the fruiting body of of the fungus. This is the same in the same group of funguses like the ones we eat. Um, the regular mushrooms that we eat. And so these are just fruiting bodies. And I, I kind of equate it to an apple on a, a tree. You know, if you pick that apple off, that tree is going to continue to, to live you know, either way. And so if you pull a fungus off of it, or a, a conch off the side of a tree, you're really not doing anything to hurt the, the rest of the, the fungus living inside the, the wood. Um, the mycelia, the, the kind of the body of the fungus, is totally colonized that log, <laughs> and so by breaking that that fungus off, you're really only making it easier to forget which trees are um, that potentially have a lot of decay in them. And so I generally recommend leaving the the conchs on there so that when you're out looking at your trees and trying to decide which one is going to be the firewood tree and which one you're going to leave for 10 years more, um, take the one with the artist conch on it first because we know that tree's already started to decay. And uh, artist conch is really um, um, a really common, I think I've said this before, most prevalent, most common forms of decay that we, we have in living trees. And it also um, is important for the breakdown of logs and stumps um, it is a white rot, and basically it causes the breakdown of lignin in the wood versus uh, cellulose. And white rot can be spongy or crumbly and brittle. And in the early stages of white, white, white rot, it's relatively sound. But as it progresses in the tree, um, the wood becomes very weak. And so that's, you know, if you see a lot of um, artist conchs or very large artist conchs, uh, the very large ones indicate that there's probably a fair bit of uh, weak wood in that tree. What it looks like from the side, and this is another, this is a good example of what the kind of damage can happen. Um, 
this tree was you know, snapped probably in a weather event and uh, not too uncommon for extensive uh, sick decay problems. And then this fungus, the, the artist conch fungus, will continue to grow after that tree has, the tree itself has died. All right, brown rot. Um, brown rots feed on the cellulose of the, of the, of the wood and they cause uh, brown cubicle rot, which is what the picture is on the, the left hand side. It's a little hard to see, but if you're ever out looking at a decaying log and it kind of chunks apart in little cubes, um, that was caused by a brown rot fungus. And chicken of the woods is a relatively common one. This is that you know edible fungus. Just be aware that um, not everyone can eat them and identify it correctly. Um, and brown rots cause a lot of wood strength to be lost you know, pretty early on in, in the rot. And so if you see chicken of the woods, that's going to be a, you know, an indicator that that tree is probably short for this world and uh, another good firewood tree. <laughs> um, here's another common one, turkey tails. Turkey tails is a canker rot, and um, this establishes in wounds and kills the bark and the cambium around that wound, and then it invades the, um, the surrounding sapwood from where it initially established. Um, this is a, a common secondary factor in our de decline in sugar maples. It can be carried by the pigeon tree mex, the horntail wasp, and so... Um, um, this is just you know something to be considered to consider. The pigeon tree mex um, is something that we find a lot in big hollows and maple trees, and it's not necessarily a primary um, attacker, but it can um, it, you know if there's high enough populations of it, it can you might find it in more places than we normally would. Um, so it's that's something that's going to be secondary. Um, the tree is already in decline. We're already we already have some some rot within the tree, and then we'll get the pigeon tree mex and the um, the turkey tails, and you know, turkey tails will get on a lot of things. Um, so, but turkey tails can attack living trees or cause problems in living trees as well as they are a real common decomposer, and that is the role of most of our decay funguses is that they are designed to break down you know woody plant material or biomass and return it to nutrients that can be taken up by other trees um, or other plants in the forest. And so it's all part of the, the cycle. And while we want to try to minimize the damages that the, the um, decay fungus cause, um, we don't want to, and we can't really, eliminate it from our forests. Um, it's, it's really just too prevalent. And if we didn't have it, we would have uh, uh, walls of, of wood that we wouldn't be able to move through or have things grow in. Uh, another another fun one, Armillaria root rot. Um, this is again a de another decay fungus, and um, the the picture in front is an aspen that has fallen, um, and you can see that um, this is this is what we more worry about than its role as a decay fungus. It, it's a root rot, and so it will get in to the roots and the butts of trees and cause um, cause root death. And uh, in this case, the the root system was weakened enough that uh, it was able to be toppled over by, you know, a windstorm. And, um, you know, this is what is a campsite, and so that could have been potentially potentially dangerous um, if you have this around any kind of facilities where people might be. But, um, you know, it's also not so good for your, your woodlot if you're trying to manage those trees for for timber or for um, for anything that requires upright trees. Um, Armillaria is a really, really kind of neat and easy to identify fungus. It um, it has um, a lot of a lot of different growth stages that we'll we'll find. Um, initially, we'll see the mycelial fans underneath the bark of the tree, and the mycelia is the the body of the fungus, and that's the picture on the left. You can see kind of the white fans moving. Um, they look like they're almost moving up the the, the trunk. And the bark has been peeled off there. And um, you can peel the bark away. And if you see that, you might also find the rhizomorphs. Um, this fungus is also called shoestring rot because of these rhizomorphs. And they are a stiff structure. They're black. And they're almost like 
roots of the fungus and they will also grow between the bark and the wood and you can actually peel them off uh, the wood surface and uh, they're, they're stiff enough that they'll hold up on their own. Um, the, um, um, once the fungus has kind of become established within the tree, then we might start to see the fruiting bodies or the, the honey mushrooms and they um, um, we'll primarily see them once there's a fair amount of decay happening, um, but they can they can be living at the bottom of a, a you know, living tree, but um, we'll often we'll see them around dead material. Um, our malaria can get in if you know the tree's already kind of on its way out. It, it generally can get in and, and cause final tree death, um, and so we do worry about having high amounts of our malaria in our in our forests. This is what can happen. Um, this is uh, the butt rot. You know, once it's killed the roots, it can kind of decay up into the butt, um, the stump of the tree, and um, cause some, some serious structural issues. And the picture on the bottom is, a, it's actually in a golf course, but it gives you a really good example of what can happen. Um, the tree was blown over. There is a major hollow within that tree, and so it, it can be dangerous as well as causing you know, wood loss. Another easy to identify conch. Mushroom conchs are great because they are a lot of fun. You can get um, books that talk about them and all that stuff. But um, varnished conch, uh, Ganoderma suge, um, is specific to hemlock. And so it's something that we see a fair bit of around here anyways. And it causes a white, white stringy rot in the, the butts and roots of hemlock. And we generally see this as a, you know, the final straw kind of fungus. This is not a, a primary attacker. It will come in with other after other predisposing factors have weakened the tree. And we do also see this as a decay uh, fungus in, in logs. Um, it, it is shiny and hard on the surface and is um, um, pretty unmistakable uh, as far as the mushrooms go. All right. An entirely different type of fungus. This is the uh, Phytophthora, and Phytophthora can take many different shapes and forms. Um, it can be a, a leaf and shoot blight, a twig and limb dieback fungus, it can cause root and crown rot, stem cankers, or collar rot. Um, th there are three that people may have heard of. The one, hopefully, that you have heard of is sudden oak death. This was the relatively um, recent discovery of um, Phytophthora remorum um, in, in oaks in California. It was, it's been causing kind of devastating oak uh, die, die back and death. And it, in oak, it primarily shows itself as a, a bleeding canker, which then it kind of expands and, and can kill the tree. Um, it, it alternatively, it lives in multiple hosts, um, primarily laurels and things like that in the understory. And um, the picture to the, the left of the bleeding canker is the spot on laurel. Um, very, very common, um, uh, well, relatively common in California, and we, we kind of hope it stays there. Um, it's not in New York, and there's been a lot of regulations put in place to hopefully keep it from getting to New York. Um, but we do have other ones, such as uh, Phytophthora cinnamomi and uh, Phytophthora cactorum, which primarily we see as bleeding cankers in a variety of things, European beech, um, sugar, sugar maple, all sorts of things. And so... Phytophthora can be very common. Um, you, you'll mostly hear, at least I mostly hear people talk about it um, as a bleeding canker or as a, a root and crown rot in uh, seedlings. Um, another, another fun one, <laughs> crown gall. Um, this is actually a bacteria. And um, this is something that can, uh, can be problematic. Very few plants are actually killed by crown gall. But if you have it in seedlings, so if any of you are doing um, planting of, of, of um, you know, seedlings, forest trees, you uh, could potentially get rootstock or stock that's infested with this, and you'll see this gall right at the base of the the, um, the um, root crown. And um, what it, it can potentially kill the plant, but what it will do is predispose the, that plant to 
infections by other pathogens. Our malaria is a really good example. Um, and when we see it in larger trees, you know, it's kind of a, you know, it slows down growth. It, ca it causes um, a reduction in the value of the tree. Um, and the galls can be rather large. The, um, the picture on the, the right, you know, that's a, that's a good size gall, um, up to 30 centimeters or more in diameter. And it can actually persist in the soil. What happens is as the, the gall grows, it sloughs off the outer layers. And that, as that drops to the soil, that can um, live there and infect other plants and other, excuse me, other trees. And so we really, ch you know, if you, if you are getting stock in for planting or you see this, this is one of those things that you can effectively get rid of by, you know, removing. Um, if you if you're ordering in plants and they have this on them, you can reject them. Um, I would inspect your plants for this just to make sure that they they don't have it on them. Um, are there any questions on the the different diseases? We're gonna kind of switch gears a little bit. All right. Um, so a lot of the diseases that we we just went over are things that you can hopefully, well, maybe not hopefully, um, but you can probably go out and see a fair bit of these in your woods. Um, most of these aren't going to cause you know, immediate death of your trees, but they're just things to consider when you're talking about selecting trees for, um, for future harvesting, selecting trees for current harvesting. Um, with the crown gall bacteria, here's a question from Peter, would the crown gall bacteria spread to other seedlings in the batch, the whole order? I would return the whole order, yeah. Um, if they're if they're packaged together, because you don't know, there's two things you don't know. One is, you know, has any of that um, gall sloughed off, and you know, potentially will it, it will it infect the the seedlings? But some of those seedlings might already be infected, and you just don't see it yet. So I would would yes, return the whole the whole thing. Um, so the um, when we're when we're looking out in our woods for making we're out in the woods and we want to make management decisions. Knowing a little bit about the diseases um, can help us choose our management, um, you know, choose which trees we're going to remove for our management um, options, or, you know, maybe make us drastically change what our goals might be depending on the level of, of forest health. Um, there are some, some kind of basic things that you want to look at when you look at individual trees for how healthy are they. And this isn't something that you know, I would expect that you'd be able to go right out and evaluate how, you know, how healthy every individual tree is, nor should you necessarily have to, but um, you might want to go out with the concept of forest health in mind when you're looking around your woodlot. And, you know, pick a few trees and then give them a good once over. Um, you'll be looking in the canopy um, for, you know, kind of what's up there, all the way down to the surrounding soil. And you're going to you know, check out each side of the tree you know, all the way around. And you might, you could set up like a, an actual plot and go back multiple times during the year or, or, you know, every year and kind of check to see what's going on. And you can use it as a benchmark of what is the level of forest health. You know, am I seeing a lot more of um, black knot fungus or a lot more um, uh, artist conch in the area of beech bark disease? You know, do I need to change what I'm managing for because of these uh, diseases? And I generally recommend evaluating trees during the summer so you can see foliar problems. Um, sometimes, you know, major structural issues or things that are happening up in the crown can be hidden by leaves. So, you know, going out in the winter in addition to summer isn't necessarily too bad. But if nothing else, you should be out there in the summer. You can see most of the, most of the problems in the summertime. So start at the top, kind of. Look for the obvious things. Are you seeing any large dead limbs? Um, are there galls or cankers or things that you can see up at the, at the top of the tree? Are our leaves the correct size and their color? Um, the picture on the left is uh, supposed to be a um, red maple growing well, and that's a picture taken in July. And so we know right away just by looking at the leaves that there's something going on with the root system in this tree, because this, um, this was a young tree. And I know what the problem was there, but um, improper planting did that one in. But if you see that in your, your forest trees, and I, you, know, you can go out and see really small leaf size on some of your trees, those might be trees that are over mature and they're just not 
um, they're not able to grow very big. They might be in compacted soil. Um, they might have had a fair bit of damage to the root system or to the base of the tree. And so that tree might be a good candidate for um, either retaining as a wildlife tree or um, you know, removing from the woodlot. Um, the tree on the or the picture on the right is an um, um, example of a nutrient deficiency in leaves. So you can see the, the, the chlorosis, the yellowing of the leaves, and the green kind of uh, venal areas, and that's that's a very typical nutrient deficiency. Um, if you start to see something like that, you you know you might consider having a soil test done. If you see it in a lot of your trees, um, if it's only one or two trees, you, you probably have an individual root issue um, with with that tree. Early fall color. Um, this is something that is a, a good tell-all for drought problems or even uh, flooding. You know, multiple flooding. Um, Trees that are under a lot of or multiple years of stress will often show early fall color. Red maples will be the first ones to show early fall color. And um, you know, if you in the fall, and I'm sure you, you you've seen this, you know, it'll be August and you'll be driving around and there'll be a bright red red maple all ready to go for the fall. It'll you know a month or two early, and there's something going on with that tree, and so it's just kind of a, a tip off. Um, how transparent are the trees? You know, can you see through the trees? This is a summertime picture, and notice that the tree on the left is very, very bare compared to the tree on the right. And you know, again, what's what's going on there? It's these are just kind of tip-offs for um, for further investigation. What's our twig, twig growth rate like? Um, twigs will, or branches, every year they when they have their when they set their terminal bud. A scar is formed around that twig, and so you can count back a few years of growth on a on a branch, looking for that scar. And um, generally, depending on the you know the species of tree, you're going to want to have six inches of growth, um, or maybe maybe even more, depending on how vigorous that tree is growing. And so, you can grab a hold of a branch and just by looking at it, tell how quickly that tree is growing. And if you have a poor growth rate, um, there's there might be something going on with that tree where it's having to dedicate its um, it's either you know kind of dedicating its its energy on fixing that problem, or it's just not able to take up enough water or nutrients for it to grow. And you know over mature trees will tend to have really poor growth rates as well. They're just they're just done. Um, looking at the base and the tr the roots of the tree all the way, you know, kind of all the way down. Do you see conks? Do you see any damage to the, the stem of the tree? Do we see heaving or leaning? Um, these are big indicators of root rot, um, unless you've had a you know, weather event to go through. Um, but odds are, even if you have a, a weather event, most of the trees will stay upright. But kind of keep an eye on them. If they start to lean or, you know, the soil starts to tip up, that is often an indication of, of um, mechanical damage or um, root rots to the root system. And how to know when it's time to go? Um, usually, you know, if you're if you're trying to decide, you know, should I keep this tree, should I keep a, a, tree A or should I keep tree B? And tree A has a decay fungus growing on the side of it. You know, tree A is kind of, you know, that'd be first on my list. Um, multiple large broken branches is also a sign of decline. Big wounds in the trunk, the, uh, the, the roots tipping up, and then kind of any combination of these with severe predisposing stressors. And so if you know that um, you've had drought in, in that area for the last five years and you look at your trees and there's really poor growth rates on some of them, those are the ones that you're going to want to get rid of first because they're not going to be productive in that stand. And you might be able to free up more water and nutrients for the trees that are remaining by removing those those underproducing trees and um, really improve your overall forest health just by doing a little bit of thinning. Um, you know, if, even if your goal isn't timber management, um, you know, by doing a little bit of thinning out of the, the, the underproducing trees, you're providing potentially more um, mast for wildlife. You can girdle some of those trees and just have them be standing dead and provide you know, dense space. So there's, you don't necessarily have to think of it just for uh, timber management. Do you want to go out and 
do some monitoring. Um, I mentioned before you could set up a plot. You could set up multiple plots if you're really excited. <laughs> um, but you do want to check the health of your forest on a, on a regular basis. Um, you're not going to know if you have any more or less disease now than at any other point in time unless you have some kind of record of that. And um, I, I also recommend you know keeping track of big events. You know we've had forest tent caterpillar problems here in central New York for the last you know, four years. And so that's kind of something to write down because the stands that have been heavily affected from the caterpillar damage are going to be the stands that are that they have that predisposing stress in there. Um, if they've been hit with drought um, or some other kind of issue, we're going to start to see more of these disease problems within those trees. And so I do recommend keeping, you know, kind of keeping a, a log or just a, a notebook um, with what's going on. You don't need, you know, a day-to-day -day journal of what's happening in your forest. But um, you could make notes of trees that have suspicious activity or, um, you know, set up a permanent, excuse me, a permanent plot and kind of monitor the growth of those trees and kind of just see how, see how they're doing. And then I'll give you a better idea of really what's going on in your forest. You're probably going to need a few tools. Um, I recommend um, binoculars for looking up into the canopy. Um, if you really get excited about it, get a hand, le hand lens so you can look at your fungus up close. Um, you might consider drawing a map or having some GPS points for where your, your plots are or where there are you know, high outbreaks of black knot or um, armillaria, things like that. And I do recommend having a camera so that you can document what's going on. Um, I know my memory is not a photographic memory, and so just going out, if nothing else, just going out and taking pictures in the same spot, you know, four or five spots throughout your forest every year is going to be a huge, huge help for when you're trying to think about what's going on. There are many, many great books on tree problems and many websites, and we'll bring those up in just a second. Um, the kind of the, the Bible of tree funguses is Diseases of Trees and Shrubs, um, which is published by Cornell University Press, Sinclair Alliance, and Johnson. And pretty much every extension office in New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Forestry Office is going to have that. Um, and I would say in other states, your, your local forestry and extension offices would too. So if you find something that you really want identified, you can either take a picture of it or bring a sample in, and there'll probably be somebody there that would be happy to help you look it up. Um, there's also, you know, as I said, great websites um, that you can, can find this stuff on. And so I do, you know, if you, you can get books on mushrooms and books on conchs and things like that too. So if, if you're really into it, um, I would recommend getting a book. Um, the, the Diseases of Trees and Shrubs is a little, little on the expensive side, but, um, you know, borrow it from your extension office. So what can you do to improve health? Um, this is kind of the big question. Really, what you want to do is try to reduce stressors. And so in, at the beginning, we talked about you know, what are the elements that go into forest health, soil, air, spacing, light, water, trying to make that um, spread for the trees that are there. Um, that's going to be kind of crucial. And so that might involve thinning. Um, that might involve increasing your biodiversity, you might need to, like, for example, the picture on the right there is a plant, pine plantation. There's not a lot going on in the stand. And so if a disease, a pretty, you know, if a tough disease comes in there, um, these are trees that are tightly spaced. There's um, nothing growing underneath them. Um, if they start to die off, there's not a lot in this forest that's going to you know, take over. And so this would be a good example of where you might need to go in and, and do some serious biodiversity changing. Um, you might need to plant trees in this, in this instant, instance or um, um, definitely go in and, and thin some of, out, some of them out and encourage other ones to grow. And uh, really making your forest more resilient to insect and disease problems is, is the goal. Um, the forest itself may change. You know, you may not have that same pine plantation that you had when you started. But the forest is going to survive, and that's really that's something to consider as well. Um, if you have severe forest health issues that your trees just aren't able to, to handle, the, the forest will continue, but they may not meet your goals. The, the forest may not meet your goals. And so you might also have to, have to uh, realign what your management goals are to better suit your, your forest stand. And so um, 
I guess with that, I'll. This is my last slide. So if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to to type them in. I will um call up this this little box here, and this has a bunch of different. Ooh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, Rebecca, before before you do that, let's uh, let's keep them in suspense for just a minute. Okay. Um, I want them to. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's do the final okay. poll. And while you're while you're taking this final poll, you can also be thinking of questions that you can type into the chat pod. Um, so select all that apply of these boxes, and if you can multitask, you can also be typing questions into the chat pod. And then when Rebecca is um, answering the questions in the chat pod, I'll be opening up the web links that she started to show. And those will open automatically into your browser. So if you have a pop-up blocker turned on, that may that may bounce for you. But I think uh, with my pop-up blocker, I can go in um, retroactively and reaccess those sites. But we'll also put the links up in a note for the people who are going to view this web conference as a recorded item they'll be able to see the URL websites and access them manually. Okay, do we have, uh, has everybody um, sounded off that's going to? Going once, going twice on the polling. Okay, we'll close that and tuck it away. All right, so go ahead. All right, you're getting questions already, so I'll let you, uh, Rebecca, start working on the questions, and I'll take care of these web links. All right, thanks, Peter. Um, so e Lisa asked, what does lichen all over trees bark mean? Um, it can mean one of two things. If we see it on hardwood trees, um, really very common on, like, maple, for example, um, it's generally an indicator of a high moisture environment, and um, generally I've also heard that it, really likes to grow in, in good air quality stands, but I, I don't know the complete validity of that. Um, for a hardwood tree, it, there's little effect on the tree's health. It, it grows on the surface of the bark. It's the same kind of stuff that grows you know, on rocks, and so we don't necessarily worry about it. If you have a lot of it, um, it might indicate that there's a lot of moisture in the air. Um, you might have wet soils. And so it could be an indicator that it, the environment might be suitable for other, uh, or for fungus. Um, lichen, of course, is a, um, a combination of a plant and a, a fungus living together. And so it has kind of shares um, characteristics of both. The, um, if you have a lot of it, you could potentially thin out your stand and get more air movement in there. Um, or, you know, depending on what's going on, it might need more um, uh, more water being pulled out of the soil, and so you could, you know, plant some really water-loving things like willow. Um, if it's on um, evergreen trees, um, spruces in particular, it does. It, you sometimes we'll see it on growing on the branches, and it can cause problems for spruce because. When it grows over the tops of the twigs and over the tops of the, lead, the needles, it will shade them out, and it can cause um, uh, those needles to die and the branches to die. And so, you know, we try to try to minimize it a little bit in those kinds of stands. But the the trick is that if it thrives on sunlight as well as moisture, and so by thinning, you don't necessarily always remove it. It can you know, if you remove branches and things like that and increase sunlight, it can, can increase the amount of lichen that you have. All right, so Mike asked, could you please discuss some more of the effect of heavy equipment on compaction that occurs with new home construction? I would be happy to. Um, this is a big problem, actually, and um, for those that may not really be familiar with what, what we're talking about is a lot of times when you have new homes, they will come in and potentially clear out an area. Um, they might quasi fence off some trees um, you know they come into a, a forested area and they put up some orange snow fencing right around the base of the tree um, even though of course our roots do extend you know at least to the height of the tree out away from the trunk and so they're really not doing anything except protecting the trunk itself there's very little root protection when that happens um, and heavy equipment rolls around the foundation of the house putting in the you know the um, 
the concrete foundations and you know delivering materials and of course they'll stack and leave their machinery under trees and stuff like that and so compaction is really the removal of air spaces and water spaces within the soil and it increases the bulk density and two things can happen one is the actual physical breaking of roots um, from the direct impact of the heavy equipment on top of it and so that's kind of an immediate effect um, the, the secondary effect is that increase in bulk density makes it harder for the roots to actually grow in the soil and so we'll see a decline in time of the the trees ability to grow and um, you also make it really really hard to plant new trees <laughs> and they don't want to grow there either and so really what you want to do in new home construction and really anywhere else where there's going to be compaction is minimize the area that that machinery has uh, to travel in and doing things like putting up fencing is great but put it you know 20 feet away from the trees that you want to um, save or even farther so that that those trees are much the roots are much more protected um, when it comes to timber harvesting uh, skid trails, you know, making keeping keeping loggers or keeping your own travel if you're driving your trucks through the woods to, to the roads and having kind of designated roads. And you will see that the trees along the roadways will potentially have um, less growth than the trees you know, in the woods where it's more you know it's more protected. Um, this is a big reason why you know we always recommend harvesting when the ground is frozen or when the ground is completely dry. Um, driving over wet soils is going to accelerate compaction to a, a really really big degree and so you know staying out of the woods when it's really wet um, you know putting tops in the in the trail putting branches in the trail um, chips whatever to kind of minimize the effect of, of compaction is, is also recommended using machinery with treads stuff like that Rebecca I'll add to that if I can the um, and I, I absolutely agree with everything you said. The other uh, benefit or caution from a logging, um, within a logging context, is the time of year when you're harvesting. Um, people, you know, will ask when is the best time. Well, if you can get frozen ground, that's great. That oftentimes doesn't happen. Or dry ground may be more common than frozen ground if you can log in uh, late July through August or September. Um, and, and then a, a disadvantageous time to log is in the spring when the trees are just actively starting to grow in April, May, and June. The bark, uh, the, the cells underneath the bark are, are expanding and the bark is rather loosely held, um, in a relative sense is loosely held on the tree and bumping it. Uh, as, you, as you're moving trees around during a logging operation can remove great big chunks of bark that's a larger wound and therefore um, uh, more that the tree needs to compartmentalize and more the uh, more of a site for infection from microorganisms so if you can restrict your logging to dormant seasons especially you know dry dormant seasons frozen dormant seasons when you when trees are bumped which is inevitable during logging uh, the, then the wounds tend to be much smaller. And, I, and I've heard that if you can keep your wounds less than about 100 square inches, so about 10 inches by 10 inches, the tree does a pretty good job of healing it over. Now, you will have a, a defect in that log, but the long-term health and the vigor of the tree shouldn't be compromised. Somewhere between 100 square inches and 250 square inches, um, the tree's kind of iffy, and then you get bigger wounds than 250 square inches, the tree is, is really in a tough spot and has to struggle to, um, to, to stay vigorous. Um, so Lisa asks, is there something which should be put on tree wounds to protect them while, while they heal? And while we used to recommend that you did put something on, uh, we no longer do, um, it's best to leave that wound open to the air so that um, it can dry, air can circulate kind of around the wound and what will happen is the, the tree, if it's growing vigorously and the wound is you know, small enough, as Peter mentioned, it will, see, the bark will seal over that wounded area. Um, the wound itself will always be there kind of under the bark and it, the sooner it can seal over the better because it minimizes that you know, potential for decay to get in. 
but they found that the sprays that you know the tars and the paints that we used to recommend actually cause more damage um, they can trap water and uh, bacteria and things like that against the tree and actually you know, cause more harm than good and so what we used to recommend them we, we no longer do um, just clean up the wound you know if it's kind of a jagged break of a branch or um, you know, something you can kind of clean it off and um, make it the smallest wound possible and hopefully the tree will recover on its own. I used to recommend all sorts of crazy things like filling cavities of trees with cement and um, you know we don't recommend that either. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rebecca when you mentioned oak wilt I remembered reading just um, a day or two ago a uh, Forest Service fact sheet on oak wilt and so I went online and found it and you can see it there in the uh, center of the screen on in note pod number four the the, the one, one two three fourth item oak wilt control fact sheet um, and I've opened that up onto your website so for those of you in New York especially in the capital district area of New York um, that's something to pay attention to and be be sensitive to. Well, if there are no other questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Rebecca and to thank all of the participants for joining us tonight. This was a wonderful delivery and um, a really important topic. The uh, I'm sure Rebecca is the same way. Many of the calls, probably half the calls that I get or emails that I get, um, deal with issues related to forest health. So the more that we can do to be conscious of and manage for good forest health, the, the, the better we're able to um, enjoy and gain from our forests. So I'll, uh, unless there's any final parting questions, I'll, I'll bring this to a close. And uh, thank Rebecca again, and thank all of you, and wish you a, a good night. I'll remind you that a week from Wednesday, we return to our normal third Wednesday of the month web conferencing, and we'll have Brett Chedzoy talking about Argentina forests and forestry, lessons that we can bring back to, to the Northeast and the United States. So have a great evening, everyone, and I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Good night, everyone. Thank you again, Rebecca.